Good to be with you on this wonderful official start to summer for all those who are traveling and on vacation and all of our home churches and all around the, uh, the world really right now. Uh, we greet you and we're so thankful to be with you. Open your Bibles, open your notebooks, get ready uh, to take good notes. God's got something special to share with you today. Few things uh, just to share. Summer has officially begun. That's why I'm wearing my white pants, okay? Uh, I know Jenny wore hers too, so we'll do who wore it best later. Uh, but she, she did okay. I think I'm rocking them a little bit better. <laughs> Uh, but uh, summer has begun weddings, lots, lots of weddings. And uh, so we just had one of our pastors on our team and on our staff. Those of you who know him, you love him. If you haven't met him and her, uh, you, you'll absolutely fall in love with them. They're incredible people. Uh, but Pastor Yanni just got married and they're on there. Yeah, our young adult, our young adults pastor. He's just incredible. He's an awesome man of God. And Lexi, his amazing wife, is even better. And so uh, we're so thankful for both of them and praying for a wonderful time. If you guys are tuning in right now, that's not what you're on a honeymoon for. Shut this off. Go have fun and enjoy each other's company. We love you. Uh, we want to jump right into the word today. So open up your Bibles to Luke chapter one. Uh, and we're going to start in verse uh, 6 here in a little bit, but just to give you context. Um, this is the story of Zacharias and uh, Elizabeth. So at the uh, subtitle, if you will, of your notes, you could write Breaking Barrenness, and then below that, uh, you could write Elizabeth. We're just going to talk about Elizabeth today. And I'm going to give you four thoughts within Elizabeth's story uh, I think will bless you. It blessed me, and I think it will really encourage you. And the goal is to leave here better than we came in, right? <laughs> Not just go through the motions and be like, well, we went to church. It was there. Uh, let's, go, let's leave here saying, I'm glad I went, right? Uh, like the Bible says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. We're, we're, we're going to be excited to be together in the house of God. And this story of Zacharias and uh, Elizabeth uh, is unique in its nature because Zacharias is a priest uh, unto the Lord. So he does the work of the Lord. He goes to the house of God. So does not his wife. Uh, they've been doing it for many years and now they're old in age and they still don't have any kids. And so dealing with this barrenness has definitely uh, uh, hurt and uh, definitely had its place of pain. You don't do that much ministry for God and then not see God show up in those personal areas of your life and not have points of barrenness and pain and resentment. You, you deal with some of those things. Offense. You get angry with God. Can I just give you permission that it's okay to be angry with God? It's not okay to keep it hidden. Uh, you get angry and you get frustrated, but just talk with God. Talk with God. He's not a God who's going to get mad that you express how you feel about what you're walking through. God knows that you're human and you're walking through that. And, and we see even in this story, Zach, Zacharias was frustrated and he had many prayers that went to heaven and God's going to answer his prayers uh, and, and he's going to break the barrenness over Elizabeth, over Elizabeth and help them give John the Baptist. Y'all know John the Baptist, right? Prepare ye the way of the Lord. John the Baptist would prepare the way for Jesus. And, and if, if we can take one little footnote right here at the very beginning, if Jesus needed John the Baptist to prepare the way for him, then let me just tell you, number one, you need somebody paving the way for you, and Jesus has done that. But also now for the second coming of Jesus, God can use John the Baptist. God can use me for what he's about to do. If God was going to use John the Baptist to bring Jesus, God can use me for the second coming. God can use me to equip and prepare the bride of Jesus Christ today. And so God has has a clear, clear purpose for your life. And it's not just this random, vague purpose. God wants a specific, detailed purpose over your life that you feel empowered and know how to fulfill. So with that perspective, I want to go jump into this text, and I want to show you right here at the very beginning, verse 6, uh, <clears throat> right here it starts with how Zacharias was in the temple, and he was worshiping, and he was doing the ordinance of God. He would say, oh, all praise be to God, all praise be to God. He'd do another thing, all praise be to God. He'd sacrifice, all praise be to God. He'd sacrifice, all praise be to God. He was going through the motions, and he was at church, and he would go through the motions, and then the angel Gabriel showed up, and he was like, like in total fear and shock and he's like what are you doing here just 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 didn't even think that God would show up and, and that's a huge lesson for you and I is that many of us we come to church and we worship and and we don't expect God to show up we we go to church and we pray and we expect nothing to happen we we read our Bible and we expect nothing to happen if you're going to break barrenness over your life if you're going to break that empty void if you're going to break the unfruitful pattern that has been in your life the number one thing that you need to know is this you need to have expectant worship write that down we're a note-taking church if you're new to Bridge Church uh, we take good notes because we take what God is saying to us seriously and 
and don't be the only person who doesn't take notes because 90 plus percent of our church takes notes and over 90 percent says they hear the voice of God. And, and in that, you can take good notes and God can take what you're saying seriously. When you pray, don't pray impotent prayers. Don't pray unfruitful prayers. Don't have unfruitful worship. Have expectant worship, right? Uh, when a woman is expecting, right, you can tell. Now I'm gonna give you some heads up if you're young. Uh, don't guess at the beginning. Let them tell you. Don't guess if somebody's pregnant or not. Step out and say, don't step. That's not a place to step out in faith. But you, you can, uh, 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 you know, see that wonderful pregnancy, that expectancy, uh, happening in somebody. And, and can I just give you another footnote within this? When you're first pregnant, uh, for the majority of the time, uh, it takes a little longer to show. It takes a little longer. If you've been pregnant, you know pre pregnancy a little bit, you know it takes a little while. The second time you have a baby or third or fourth, you show quicker. And let me just, can I give you some footnotes of how God speaks to us? When you start learning how to receive the blessings of God in your life and you start birthing some new wonderful things in your life, you're gonna start showing quicker. Every time a new blessing comes, it's gonna, you're gonna feel it earlier. You're gonna know it. Early. When you're first, the first time you're pregnant, you're wondering if you're pregnant until the morning sickness starts. Then you know Oh, you're pregnant, right? And, and you're waiting in the signs and the feelings and the showing and you're, you're, you're like second, you take five P tests and you're like, okay, I think I am. Then the doctor tells you and you're still like, I think I am, I think I am. And then you finally get there and you know you're pregnant. But let me just tell you, as you receive the blessings that God has for you, you're gonna start living this life and saying, I know I'm blessed. The second time you get it, the first time you get it, I think I'm blessed. Second time you get it, I know I'm blessed. Third time, you start saying, I am just blessed by God. Fourth time, you are spoiled by God and you just know that the blessings of God because you have expectancy in your life. You expect God to be good because if it is not good, he is not done. And if you got breath in your lungs, then that means that there are better days ahead of you. And so God has something good for you. So you have to have expectant worship. What does that look like? I'll tell you what it doesn't look like. Expectant worship doesn't look lifeless. It doesn't look dead. It doesn't look stagnant. It doesn't look still. It doesn't look stoic. It doesn't look bored. It doesn't look disconnected. Oh, this is, well, they're singing these songs again at church. That, that's not going to produce anything in your life. There's, isn't that funny how some people will go and they'll, they'll put no effort in but expect total in, uh, return on investment. I, I invested nothing, but I expect 100%, 1,000%. I expect everything in return. I'm not really going to try to worship, but I'm going to see if this worship stuff does something before I even put any effort in. And that's not how it works. You don't learn karate by watching. You're not Dwight Schrute. You need to learn karate by putting effort in and you're going to have to take another lesson and grow and go beyond the kiddie class and start doing a little bit better. And you are going to have to start putting in expectant worship. I raise my hands because I expect something to happen. I clap because he inhabits the praises of his people. I have expectant worship. You could be even standing still and weeping before the Lord. You could be kneeling. You could be at the altar. You could be wherever. You could be in your house, your car, your work, wherever you are. Just have expectant worship. And Elizabeth paints expectant worship for us. And the first thing, see, when he hears this, when, when a, a Zacharias hears from the angel, you will have a baby. I'm breaking the barrenness. Here comes the child. Zacharias just has doubt in him. And he's a skeptical. He's a little skeptical. And so, but then that's how he responds. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. But how Elizabeth responds, Elizabeth hears it. The moment she hears it, she says, oh, I'm pregnant. Great. This is awesome. She books it and she says, I got to get prepared. I got to go put myself away. I got to prepare to have a baby, carry a baby. Here comes the baby. And the first thing that you and I need is an immediate action in our life. A expected worship looks like immediate action. Because why? Delayed obedience is still disobedience. And uh, if you don't know what worship is, it may have sounded like clapping and raising your hands, but worship is really obedience towards God. That's what we're, the definition of worship is I'm obedient to his word, his will, his way, and who he is. Well, Moses was obedient. Noah was obedient. Abraham was obedient. It was counted as righteousness and praise and worship towards God. When you're obedient towards the word of God, it's immediate response. When God says it's going to turn out good, why don't you start carrying yourself like it's going to turn out good? When God says that I'm real, why don't you start carrying yourself around like God is real and he lives in me? When, when, when you start hearing the promises of God, immediate action is required. That's what expectant worship looks like. 
like. And then number two, what she does is she not only has immediate action, but then she runs to Mary. She runs, the first person she runs to is she goes to Mary because she knows that part of the prophecy is that her son will get the Holy Spirit with her while she is while he is in her womb. And so she goes to the only one that she knows that the Holy Spirit spoke to and gave life in her womb. She goes to Mary. And this is very important because if you're gonna have a wonderful place, a blessed life, a fruitful life where you break the barrenness, you break the dryness, the void, the disconnect, all that, you're gonna step into the fruitfulness. You're gonna have expectant worship and it's gonna look like a very uh, intentional interaction. I'm going to have very intentional interaction. So then when I go uh, to hang out with people, I'm going to make sure I'm doing it because it's blessing my purpose in my life, the direction in my life, the vision in my life, uh, 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 the anointing over my life. I'm going to have intentional interaction when I go to church, that when I show up to church, I'm having an intentional, uh, intentional interaction with Jesus, an intentional, an intentional interaction. I'm getting tongue tied up here. Uh, intentional interaction uh, with God. Then I'm going to pray. I'm not going to just watch everybody go down for prayer and know I have a serious need in my life, I'm going to go get prayer. I'm going to raise my hands. I'm going to have an intentional interaction with God. I'm going to have an intentional interaction with each other. And we need that in our life. If you're going to have expectant worship, you need to know that your time matters. And, uh, and, your, and your words matter and your energy matters. And what, 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 how, how much energy are you putting towards people who aren't going to bless you in return? Who are going to strengthen you in return? Who are going to uplift you, encourage you, and build you up? You want to be around people who are building up the purpose of God in your life. Who are building up your anointing, your gifting, your talents, your abilities. Someone who looks at you and encourages you and stops living by those old stupid adages that, oh, I just don't want their head getting too big. You are not people's confidence controller. You are the one who, Paul says, you should encourage each other with every day that ends with why. And I want intentional interactions that say, you know what, they bless me more than they drain me. You don't need more relational vampires. You need people who actually literally pour into your life more than they receive from your life. That's why I said I love this church. It's easy because I feel like I get just as much from this church as I give this church. Because if it just drained me every day, I wouldn't be here very long. <laughs> but this is a huge part of how expectant worship, of stepping into that fruitfulness. The last thing that she did is this. Uh, they wrote a song. They wrote a song, they started singing. Mary started singing, and she started singing, and then they all started getting excited. In fact, when they got close and their bellies touched, uh, I don't know if their bellies touched or not, but I thought it would, I think it would be like, you know, just in my mind, that's where I pictured they just walked up and be like, I got Jesus, I got John, boop. And then, they, and, and then the life, like John, the Bible says, and John leapt in her womb. Like he was like, oh, he came alive and he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And so uh, when he had the Holy Spirit right there, all of a sudden this life and this, it's amazing. Uh, and then they wrote a song. Now, if you don't know a lot about childbearing, uh, uh, it's not only dangerous still today, but back then, uh, neither one of them have really gone to the second or third term. Uh, we know that because of the timeline. We also know that they haven't delivered. And we know that in those times, a large percentage of stillborns happened on, like, repeatedly. Uh, it, it, there was a lot of deaths with childbearing. Uh, the, the, the mother might die, the baby might die. And, and, and we could easily look at their life and say, well, we know it worked out for the good. And we see all these people. There's 8 billion people on this planet today. Obviously, childbearing works, right? And so we, we're, we're, we're easy with that. But let me tell you, it's easy to look in reverse. But when you're looking forward and you're expectant with your worship, you're going to praise God and sing God and you say, I, he, we haven't delivered this baby. It hasn't come yet, but I know that God is good. And this is what you need is you need an inspiring reaction in your life. That when God comes in your life, when the Holy Spirit gives a, a divine word over your life, when God blesses your life, when God brings a friend or a family or a loved one or a church member, God puts you into a group of people who actually care about you. Somebody ought to start saying, thank God that I haven't been ignored, but God's saw me and he remembered me and he blessed me and I don't just have relationships I have great relationships I have great friendships if you got one good friend around you you better slap them and say I'm talking about you <laughs> there was very little slapping I, I, I hope there are more friends out there <laughs> I hope there are family. I hope there's somebody who loves you because you ought to. You ought to. You have a church that loves you. You have a church that prays for you. I go and travel around. When I do travel around Arizona, around this uh, United States, mainly in Arizona is what I'm thinking about right now. And I go around and I meet people in Havasu and in Phoenix and I go around in Tucson and I just meet people. Oh, Pastor Landon, you don't know me, but I stream. You don't know me, but I tune in and we watch every week and I'm thanking God that we have such wonderful people who are connected to the body of Christ who bless this church and we bless them. And it's a 
strength to the body. It's a strength to my relationships. It's a strength to this church. Why? Because I want to be inspired. I want to inspire others. And I want something to leap in me and say, you know what? I want to start rejoicing for what God will do. Because if this is where we are right now, how great will it be in the future? And if you start praising God for where you are, he'll start showing you where you can go. And God is going to reveal a great future, a great promise, a great hope, a great plan for you. But it's going to start with expectant worship, expectant obedience, saying, God, I know if you've been faithful, you'll remain faithful. Even when I'm not faithful, even when I'm not good, God, you'll take care of me. God, you'll provide for me. God, you'll watch over me. Expectant worship. And then what happens? I want to read it to you. Verse 13, it says this, but the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard. So in other words, he's been praying, God bless my wife for the child. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear a son. Now watch all of these details. And you shall call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will also, it keeps going, he will also go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That's a lot of details for a little baby. That's a lot of direction. That's a lot of information. You know, most of you, when you were born, you're like, I I hope they just have a good life. I just want them to be a good baby. I want them to, how about, I want them to sleep good. I'm just praying that prayer right now over my life. I have a two month old. I'm like, Lord, bless me with good sleep. Or, Lord, I'm praying for a good marriage. I'm praying, speaking of the baby, and he shall appear. Uh, But you have this wonderful, you want to pray, oh, God, they're going to be good. I want them to have good rest. I want them to have a good life. I want them to, most parents, this is what they pray over their children. I just want them to have a good marriage, a good job, a good career, a good, good, good. But did you know good is the enemy of great, and you serve a great God? And I'm not just here just to talk to you, just to hype you up on like uh, uh, hyper spiritual stuff that's not really going to impact your life. But what uh, the Bible says in uh, Psalms, uh, Proverbs, Proverbs 23, verse seven, it says, so a a man thinks, so is he. So if you believe it, you're going to see it and you're going to start becoming it. You need to start deciding, okay, God, I, I, I want to believe that my best days are ahead of me and that these wonderful children are born for a greater purpose and a greater design. And so, well, uh, uh, we, 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 I'm putting it like this, that God wants to, uh, directly define your destiny. And and I'm making this a 3D, the law of 3D. Because when you're talking about how we live in 4D, four dimension, we live in the reality of the fruition of what life really is, the fullness of it. I don't just see partial, I see complete. And I'm able to see that because of the life we live. Now, if you're talking about 3D, you get the length, you get the depth, and you get the width. You get most of the information. You're not 2D, it's not a flat surface, but you get, uh, you get a picture. And that's what I want you to lean in with me. Stay with me for just a second. Because I truly see in Scripture and in this picture, As much as God defines the direction over John the Baptist's life, he doesn't give him everything. It doesn't say that he'll wear locust or he'll eat locusts with honey. He'll wear camel hair. He'll be beheaded when he's the age of 33. None of those things. He doesn't say any of those things. He he says, this is, uh, he just says, this is what he's called. Now we read that and we see a lot of description of what John the Baptist would do in his life. Amen. If you don't know John the Baptist, you need to read about his life. John fulfills all of that. Now, while that is a picture, that's not the fullness of the picture. And what God is calling you to is a directly defined destiny for your life. But how does he shape that? You might not have the full picture, but there's three major things that I see throughout all of scripture. Just like 3D is length, it's depth, it's width. There are three dimensions that God will give everybody, every single person on this earth, what God will give you while you are on this planet and how to direct you and how to give you details of your life. Are you ready for him? Number one is this. We see it right in this scripture and we see it with many other stories, purpose. God always gives purpose before anything else. I'm going to call you to be a witness. I'm going to call you to go turn the hearts of them back to me. I'm going to call you, Jonah, to go and tell them to repent. I'm going to tell you, I'm calling you to build an ark. I'm calling you, Abraham, to go to a land I will show you. I'm calling you to a purpose. It's always purpose-driven first. 
the old school book now it's old school which is even sad to say that i feel like i'm still young to even say that but uh, purpose driven life you need to write read it get it if you can it's an amazing book by pastor rick warren and that right there will shape a lot of what i'm teaching you today but this is a huge piece of our faith that we need to have be purpose driven everywhere you see it in scripture it's purpose first now the world will tell you it's family first me first you first hustle first work first that first them first this first there's a lot of first but there's a law called the law of first things and the law of first things that means God comes first in every area of my life that means God's purpose over my life is number one in my life Christians will tell you it's family first but that's not true either it's God first the married couples hey it's my marriage first no it's God first no it's my kids first no it's God's first it's God's purpose first even beyond anything God starts speaking the purpose of John before he says anybody's name or any nation or any uh, any direction because the second thing that follows is people God will always call you to a people Okay, I'm calling you to, uh, even in business, God will say, I'm calling you to reach this market. God, even in, in, in your mission of being a witness, God says, okay, I want you to go to the Jews and you go to the Gentiles. I want, I'm calling you to a people. And God will call you to your family first. God will call you to a people that he surrounds you with. Maybe it's the people in your school, your friends, your natural network. Wherever God is calling you, it will be people first. But this is the truth that I want to share with you today. Many people put people before purpose. And so when you're pursuing people first, you'll always be chasing purpose. But when you put purpose first, people will always follow. It's easy for people to follow someone who is on purpose, someone who is on a mission of purpose, someone who is moving their life with a purpose. When you can tell that they're more about people pleasing and just trying to gain more, can't you feel it? You know, how many are old enough where you've gone past high school and now you're in college, maybe your later years, and then you get that somebody sliding into your DMs saying, hey, I got a great opportunity for you, and this is a once in a lifetime thing. Have you ever wanted to work from home and make six figures? Come on, y'all know what I'm talking about? And it's that one friend, and you could feel they don't care about you hey it's been they started with the question how's it been I got a great thing I want to share with you my life has been incredible and they got a great new thing to make you rich or make you fit on all of that but there's an agenda behind it because you can feel there are people they're out for that first they're not about purpose they're about trying to get people and let me tell you when you're on a mission when you're on purpose people will follow it's easy to do that some most of the, uh, the greatest leaders in our world in our history have always been on a mission that people could get behind are you on a mission that people could get behind? Because then people follow. And then the last thing I want to give you on this uh, note is this, place. God will always give you a place. Where did he call you? Did he call you to that church? Or are you just hopping from church to church every time you get offended? Did he call you to that city? Or are you just leaving that city every time you feel like it's not working out easy for you? Did he call you to that school? Or are you just leaving every time the professor doesn't like you? Did he call you to that? Where did he call you? Because there's a place that God has called you to. And when you learn how to put down roots, when you learn how to be planted like a tree by living waters, how many know I'm quoting scripture? You learn how to fr be fruitful. You learn how to multiply. You learn how to stop saying, I am the roaming wanderer because God has never called anyone to be a a roaming wanderer. The only one who is assigned that title is the devil himself. You are meant to plant. You are meant to take over a territory. If you keep bouncing around, we'll never take territory for the kingdom. If you keep moving around, you'll never take ownership in that business, that world, that market, that place, that, uh, that uh, uh, gateway for the kingdom of God. God is calling you to a place. Just like some of us, we're called here. We're called to flag. I love Flagstaff. As much as I love lots of different places, and I love Lake Havasu, and I love Phoenix, I love being in this 75-degree, beautiful weather in the summer. As much as my parents want to trade me and be like, hey, you could be here in the summer, and we'll be there. No, the devil is a liar, and, and I, I belong here, and this is my place. And I belong here, and I'll fight for here. <laughs> I'm like, you stay there in the summer, and then I'll see you a little bit in the winter. Th this is our place. This is where God has called. Some people right now, they're on a mission. We sent some of our people, they're on a mission right now, on their way, flying right now to Africa to go to a place, to take territory, to influence a people, because they're on a mission with a purpose. It was all purpose first that called them to a people. We have a mission trip leaving on Thursday to go to Mexico, because there are people with a purpose who are called to 
to a people down in Mexico who are going to a place to impact for the kingdom and the glory of God. Because when God gives you a clearly defined direction, when God gives you a 3D perspective of where you are headed, it, you might know, not know how it's all going to work out, but you can see that it will work out. I don't know exactly what my future holds, but I do know who holds it, and I do know what he has spoken over it. And it's not just these vague generalities that God says, oh, I have a, a good plan for you. No, no, I know that God told me our ministry will thrive and grow and flourish and expand, and we will reach all kinds of cities all around Arizona that don't have a great, strong Christian impression and an example and a shining light. And God is calling us to dark cities. God is calling us to places where the gospel is and preached. God is calling us to those places because I'm a man on a mission. God has called me to reach Arizona and I will not leave these people and I will not leave this place because you will finally step into the fruitfulness and the blessing that God has for you when you start understanding that clearly defined destiny that he's given you. So don't just pray anything. I want you to pray those three things over your life. If you're missing any of those, just pray those three things. God, show me my purpose and don't try to, don't wait for something that's so, oh, so complicated God just told, may say, just be a witness. God may say, be a hope, be a light. Then he's going to call you to a people. It'll start unpacking. It may look 3D and you don't have the full picture, but you will when you get there. Just start stepping into that, pur uh, that purpose and that place and that people, and, we're, and God will unpack, unveil, and reveal everything to you. So then we move on. From there, uh, we see now in verse 18, it says, And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years. And the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. But behold, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. God's word will be fulfilled. You get to decide whether you are a part of it. And God will be a blessing through you or around you. If God starts blessing somebody in your neighborhood... You ought to start letting him know you are next door. Don't let God pass you by because you want to be the skeptic in the equation. Listen, it was his only job. Zacharias had one job. What do we take? We said it. We started off with it. He'd do a sacrifice. Oh, praise be to God. He'd do another thing. Oh, praise be to God. And he'd do another thing. Oh, praise be to God. He had one line. And the angel shows up and tells him his greatest desire and dream is about to be fulfilled. And all he needs to say is praise be to God. <laughs> and he didn't even get that right. He was like, well, I don't know. I mean, you are an archangel Gabriel standing before me. And he had all, standing in front of an angel, he's like, well, I don't know if it's possible. <laughs> God is standing in front of you right now. And he is telling you, I'm not God. God is standing in front of you because God is everywhere. And God is standing in this place. The Spirit of God is here telling you today that God is saying, I'm going to bless you and favor you. God, I'm going to increase you and multiply you. Your best days are ahead of you. you got tremendous potential and talent and abilities. You have been doubted by the world. You have been hated on by others. But I am here to tell you what the world says does not shape your future. But what I have declared over you, don't let the skeptic win. And this is the major thing you got to take away is you got to silence the skeptic. If you are going to step out in fruitfulness and blessing in your life, you're going to have to silence the skeptic. And I'm going to give many in here permission. If you got a hater or a gossiper, or a naysayer, or somebody, a voice in your past that told you you weren't smart enough, good enough. I'm here to tell you, you have full permission in the gospel to pray, God, silence that voice. God, silence that voice over my mind, over my family, over my marriage. They told me that our marriage wasn't good. They told me my style of parenting wasn't good. They told me that this was bad. They told me I won't amount to anything. I'm here to tell you, don't let them shape that. Silence that voice. You can pray that. That's why the lion's mouth for Daniel were shut because Daniel had too much purpose. Daniel had a destiny. He'd be a prophet among prophets. He would prophesy about the Holocaust. He would prophesy all the way into prophecies with John, the revelator in Revelation. Thousands of years later, he had too much on him. And so God caused those lions' mouths to be shut. 
And I see it throughout all of Scripture. When the, the nation of Israel was wandering in the wilderness, they tried to get these uh, warlocks and witches to curse, uh, to curse them. And when they tried to curse them, they couldn't curse them because they said, you cannot curse what God has already blessed. Yes. God caused them to be silent. God will cause your enemies to be silent. Now, the difficult part is this. You might be your worst enemy. You might be your greatest skeptic. Every time God says, you should write that book, you say, but yeah, I'm really, I, I just don't know how, and I'm not that smart, and I've never written a book. God tells you to launch that business, and you're like, yeah, but I don't have enough money, and we can't do this. And Let me just tell you, no one's ever done greatness with enough. They've always done great things with not enough. <laughs> Uh, great battles were won usually by not enough and great businesses were launched with the guy who didn't have enough and most of the greatest stories you appeal to started in a garage and it started at the low and started with lots of failure and it was never enough and if you're always looking for enough then he'll never be your enough but if you could say okay God you are my enough you are good enough in my life and I may not have it all but I know you have it all and if you're calling me to do this then I'm going to silence the skeptic in the mirror I'm going to silence the hater. I'm going to silence the naysayer. I'm going to shut the door just like Jesus did. Jesus would shut the door when he went to Jairus' house. Why? Because there was a bunch of mourners and wailers out there who said, that, oh, the girl is dead. The girl is dead. What are you doing here? And Jesus said, she's not dead. She's alive. Yes. And then he, they, they continued to mock Jesus. So Jesus said, shut up. Yes. I just want you to make eye contact with me. With all seriousness, you have permission not to post, not to go up and walk into somebody's face and yeah, my pastor told me to shut you up today. That's how you get fired real quick. I'm not saying that, but I am saying submit it to the Lord. Pray about it. Lord, shut those mouths. Shut that voice up. Shut that, wor that word over my life that said I am not good enough. That life just needs to be a struggle bus that I just got to do okay and mediocre, that I'm only allowed to do one notch above my parents and I can't do too good because I just need to remember my place in life. No, no, whatever that is, I'm telling you, the devil is a liar. You need to silence the skeptic. You need to, you need to tell him to be quiet. Over, I, I looked up all these, I was trying to look up quotes about skepticism and quotes, you know, anti-four, all that kind of stuff. There were way more quotes about the goodness of being a skeptic than there were against it. it. It literally, the world is in a place where it says it's good to be skeptical. Why? Because we got a government worth being skeptical about. And I'm not, uh, that's not about anything. Don't get, don't take me in any direction. I'm talking about people. Uh, I don't trust man's word and people's stuff. I trust God. We, 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 you want to get skeptical about government? You want to get skeptical about those things? Yeah, go ahead. Don't get skeptical about the word of God over your life. Don't get skeptical about the, the, the wonderful place that God is calling you to. You want to get skeptical about this new Kanye that's not really real? You, you get skeptical about him. Don't get, if you know, you know. If you want to get skeptical about a lot of things in this world, then be skeptical about that. But don't be skeptical about his word. Don't be skeptical about his hope towards you, plan towards you, praise towards you, adoration towards you, his love towards you. Don't get skeptical about how much he believes in you. Because if God believes in you more than you believe in you, you want to start wondering where is my faith and God is calling you to a new level of faith a new level of hope a new level where you can expect God to do the blessing the abundance the goodness the wonderful the fruitfulness over your life because I'm gonna silence that skeptic there are a lot of people out there like well I'm just I'm not a skeptic I'm just I, I, I critique I like to critique no you're just a critical mean person <laughs> Oh, I just, you know, I'm a refiner. I just think of ways to make it better. No, no, you're just really rude and you don't know how to be nice and say something positive. And, and look, if you could go through scripture and you read the whole life of Jesus and you tell me how to justify that negative attitude with that and you, with Jesus' life and Jesus did it too, then I'll walk with you. I'll, I'll agree with you. But I don't see it anywhere in Jesus' life that he operated like that. We ought to encourage each other every day with it, ending with why, including ourselves. Yes. Build yourself up in the faith. Isn't that what the Bible says? Build yourself up. Build yourself up. God is not in the business of tearing you down. That's what the enemy does. But the enemy has taught you that's part of God's plan for your life too is just to remind you your place. That's not how God works. Silence the skeptic. Many of us, we are aborting these beautiful new things that God wants to do with somebody else's terrible negativity. Yes. 
We're abort- Somebody says, oh, you went to ch- you go to church and you feel it. You come to church and you're like, man, I, I think I felt something good. I mean, these other Christians, they were acting like it. But there was a moment I was like, ooh, okay, I get it. I feel it. And, and it wasn't the whole time, but it was that one time. And I don't know, maybe church might be real. And you leave and then you got that hater, you got that skeptic, you got that naysayer. And they come and like, come on, man, church isn't real. You didn't feel it. And pretty soon that little life that had just begun is already aborted before it could even grow. Why? Because you got the wrong people around you. You get something new in your life. You get something stirring in your life. You get something positive in your life. And then all of a sudden you remind yourself and you become your worst enemy and start telling yourself, you don't deserve to have have something that good. Did you really feel it? Did God really do it? Did prayer really work? Did worship really move you? Did the word really stir you? Did you really connect with it? Let's really, let's rehash that because our mind will look back and try to tell us everything wrong with everything right. Don't let your mind tell you Let your heart, let your faith, let your spirit speak in that moment, not the skeptic. The last thing that I want to give you is this. As we get ready to close, uh, Elizabeth goes through what many mothers go through. She's got this wonderful baby, the prophecy over it. This baby will be filled with the Holy Spirit while he's in your womb. It's amazing. But she goes through what many, especially first time, second time moms, you know, we know that, I know that person, we know it personally now, but now we hear many stories about it. You you have all this things that are happening and you feel the pregnancy and then you get a little further into it and then there's days even, multiple days where you're wondering, "Uh oh, I haven't felt the baby move in a, I I don't know if y'all know what I'm talking about. And you're just like, and and then a new mom will, we're, call the doctor. Hey, let's check. Hey, let's go get a little ultrasound and let's hear that baby. Well, I need to hear something. And we try to hear the heartbeat because we're trying to figure out, oh my gosh, what is going on? Is this baby still alive? And what she does, this is huge. She just says, you know what? I don't know what's going on. I can't feel John moving. I don't want to lose John. I don't want to lose the hope, lose the promise, lose the faith. So she goes to the one person, Mary who she knows has life in her too by the power of the Holy Spirit. And she says, if one person can fill my baby with the Holy Spirit, it's the one who has been filled with the Holy Spirit. So she goes to Mary and she says, Mary, I don't feel John anymore. And she gets close and all of a sudden her wonderful womb leaps. John leaps in her womb and life is stirring. And now she says, oh my gosh, I am filled with the Holy Spirit right there in that moment. And for you and I, this is a major piece of breaking barren over your life and it's this you need to have leaping life around you I need somebody who causes me to have a little more pep in my step I need to uh, get to get around somebody when I get a good word from God that makes that good word come alive I need to get around somebody that when I say man I love Jesus with all my heart they say me too I'm excited about what God can do in our lives I want to get around people who stir my faith who, who cause me to leap who cause me to walk away better than I walked in I want to encourage you, if you're going to break that barrenness of your life, you need both sides of this equation. Maybe you need to be the person who goes and gets around the people to cause life to leap in you. And maybe you need to be the person who causes life to leap in others. Both sides of this equation are needed, and you can be both. Where sometimes you are the person, let, let me ask you this. When people leave your presence, do they feel stronger, healthier, better, more encouraged and happier than they walked up to you? Or to leave more drained, more blah, more bored, more tired. Have you heard phrases like, man, after the, you've been hanging out all day, do you hear, man, I'm exhausted? Got real quiet. Yeah. Because you're thinking back. And I'm telling you, you need to have people leave your company and say, what was it that stirred in us? This happened with the young men on the road to Emmaus. They didn't even know Jesus was walking with them. Jesus walked them the whole way. And then by the time they sat down and ate and Jesus revealed who he was, they said, did not our hearts leap and set on fire? Were we not stirred to the core when we were walking with him? They were encouraged just walking with Jesus. When was the last time you caused that life? When was the last time you needed that? Get around somebody who causes life to leap in you. I want you to stand with me and we're going to pray and dismiss. If you're going to live that blessed life, you're going to live that abundant life, that fruitful life, I'm going to tell you right now, the fruitful needs to be multiplied with fruitful. If the Holy Spirit has caused you to be fruitful, love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, gentleness, guess what? Get around somebody who has love too. Don't get around somebody who drains your love. Get around somebody who has that same fruit. 
Get around somebody who has joy and peace. Get around somebody who has gentleness and kindness and goodness. Get around somebody who has patience and self-control. Get around the people who can multiply your fruit, not take your fruit. Not continue to say, hey, what can you do for me? Hey, this is what I need from you. Get around people who say, man, there's greatness in you, who pour back into your life. And be that person who steps into other people's lives and say, let me cause greater fruit to come in you. Let me cause a greater blessing to come over your life. Let me pray over you. I'm going to tell you right now, God blesses me. And everybody who's connected to me is going to be blessed. Everybody. And everybody who is connected to me, I watch the blessing because I believe the word of God. Just like David said, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. What he was saying is everybody who follows me will be blessed because they're a part of my life. Why? Because I'm a life-giving man and I will make sure that everyone around me is blessed just like me. And I want to bless those. I want to be a blessing. I want to be blessed by those around me. And that's what God is calling us all to, to step into a blessed life. As you come into church and, and you see that one person you know who hates to worship, you avoid that row and you find a different row. You find a row and a person that loves to worship. You find a row. Maybe you need to be the contain. You got so much worship, you're like, I'm going to break them today. And you get over there and you're like, come on, let's go. And you just raise your hands and you jump. You might hit them once or twice and you get them worshiping. You get them going. And then all of a sudden, man, you start elevating. You start elevating their life. You start smiling. Every time they look at you, they're frowning. What are you smiling about? You know, and you just smile every time you're around them. Because every once in a while, we do need to hug that little cactus. And they might be a little prick. But let me tell you, you got to love them through it. Because every once in a while, every hundred years, they're going to grow a flower. And it's going to be so worth it. But you got to love people through that. You got to help people. You got to coach people. You got to continue to pour that fruit. You got to continue to be that fruit. You got to continue to have that leaping life factor. If you're wondering about life and fruitfulness and blessing on you, you need to find somebody who is blessed and say, okay, I know you are blessed. I don't really feel it right now. I need to get around you. And all of a sudden, you get around people who are being blessed, you start watching your life being fruitful more than you could have ever hoped, dreamed, or imagined. Because there's that leaping life factor that we all need.